Thank you for joining the Nature of Oaks and Oak Regeneration in Michigan webinar. Um, we're going to get started now. This is a very special uh, presentation. We have Doug Talmy and Mike Cost tonight. Uh, the webinar is presented by the Washtenaw County Conservation District as part of our Native Plant Expo and Marketplace Educational Speaker Series. I'm uh, Doug Reith, the Washtenaw County Conservation District Resource Coordinator and your host tonight. If you're unfamiliar with us, the Washtenaw County Conservation District is a local government agency operating since 1948 with the mission to assist residents with conservation, management, and wise use of natural resources within Washtenaw County. We passed a millage in 2020 to expand our capacity and services, which included the Michigan Agricultural Environmental Assurance Program, known as MEEP, conservation assistance for local, state, and federal cost share opportunities, uh, educational conservation workshops, uh, annual resource distributions and tr of trees and shrubs, native plants, and rain barrels. And more information you can find on our website, washtenawcd.org. Um, this webinar is part of our speaker series for the Native Plant Expo and Marketplace. Um, this brings together native plant nurseries, landscaping companies, conservation organizations, and more. The event takes place on Saturday, June 4th uh, from 9 to 1. And this year we'll be at the Chelsea Community Fairgrounds. It's a different location this year. Uh, if you're interested, there's native plant pre-sales uh, going on now um, for over a hundred different species. And we also have over 50 different species of trees and shrubs for our tree and shrub sale. So check out store.washtenawcd.org. Um, and those, those plants will be available to pick up at the expo and our future distributions. Um, and I'm pleased to announce a special bonus for tonight is that uh, since the topic of our webinar is on oaks, um, we will be offering a $3 discount for any pin oaks purchased on our online uh, pre-sales. Um, uh, I think the chat, yep, the link is there on the chat. Um, so that discount is available now until uh, noon tomorrow, um, but please uh, don't rush right now. We wanna make sure you have the full presentation uh, the full, your full presence for the presentation. Uh, we have some very smart folks and we, we wanna make sure we're tuning into them and not shopping quite yet, even if you get inspired. So um, next I'd like to introduce uh, the, our outreach coordinator, Drew, who will be helping with our Q and A. Hi there, everyone. Uh, my name is Drew Mark Wilson. Like he said, I'm the new outreach coordinator for Washtenaw Conservation District and I'll be taking your questions so I'll be keeping track of the Q&A. That's how you'll get your questions in and we'll be answering them at the end. That is at the bottom of your screen. And opening it, the Q&A will allow you to ask questions and you can even like other people's questions. Um, this will allow me to keep it all together. And it would be even better if you were able to direct the question either to uh, Doug or Mike so I can uh, ask them directly at the end for you. Um, if you have any questions for me, you can uh, throw that in the chat if you're confused about how to access the Q&A. But thank you for joining us. Um, and I would like to introduce our community forester, Summer Roberts. Hi, Summer? everyone. Thanks. Thanks, Drew. Hi, everyone. The forestry program at WCCD is still in the development stages. So I just want to take a moment to encourage all residents of Washtenaw County, especially forest or woodland owners, to please reach out to me. Uh, let me know how we could be of help, whether you need specific tools or if you'd like more educational programming on a specific topic or if you'd like on-site assessments. Um, I'd also like to hear from city dwellers, of course, about urban trees and what support you need as well. So please, anyone in Washtenaw County wants to talk about trees, reach out to me. We also have a community trees pilot project where we're examining the distribution and services of trees in four municipalities. We're looking at Bridgewater Township, Ypsilanti Township, City of Ypsilanti, and Sharon Township. So if you happen to live in any of those areas, please follow the link in the chat to a survey and please provide input for that project. Thank you so much. Thank you, Summer. Um, I do see a hand up, but if you can use the Q&A uh, chat, we'll be, uh, Drew will be watching uh, that to help answer questions. 
Um, and so I, I'm glad to introduce our initial presentation, um, Mike Cost with uh, Oaks Regeneration in Michigan. Um, Mike is serving as the associate curator at the University of Michigan Mathai Botanical Gardens and Nichols Arboretum, and as the lecturer in the School for Environment and Sustainability, where he teaches a course on ecology and botany and entitled Herbaceous Floral and Herbaceous Floral and Ecosystems. As a curator, he focuses on making data on the living collections at Mathai Nichols accessible for teaching, learning, and research. Before joining U of M, he served as the lead ecologist and senior conservation scientist with the Michigan Natural Features Inventory at the Michigan State University Extension, where he focused on documenting and describing natural communities of Michigan and working with natural resources agencies on identifying key sites for biodiversity conservation management. In his role, he co-authored over 80 publications, including the books, A Field Guide to the Natural Communities of Michigan, uh, Prairie Fens and Savannas in Michigan, um, which I'm glad to live very close to one of the, the title uh, picture of that book, <laughs> and Exploring uh, Prairie Fens of, Mich of Wetlands of Michigan. Uh, this evening, Mike will be describing the findings from a three-year research study on oak regeneration in lower Michigan that he conducted with Jeff Lee while at the Michigan Natural Features Inventory. Uh, we'll be sharing Mike's uh, research link and other resources in the chat and on our website after the presentation. So um, welcome, Mike, and thanks for being here. Thanks for the introduction. I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, so uh, you should be seeing a picture, a beautiful picture of an oak forest with wonderful oak regeneration. Um, I, I got interested in oaks and oak regeneration when I was in graduate school. I spent one winter reading about 30 papers uh, on oak savannas and uh, oak forests. And one of the things I thought was so interesting and rather alarming, uh, back in the 1940s, ecologists had begun to write about changes they were seeing in oak forests, where the overstory, the canopy layer, was dominated by oaks, white oak, black oak, red oak, sometimes chicken oak. But the understory was dominated by shade tolerant species like sugar maple, red maple, and uh, other shade tolerant species. And they were concerned about the, the future of these forests, rightly so, transitioning from oak dominated to, to maple or other species dominated. And with that, would be a loss of biodiversity in terms of all the species those folks support. And um, so, so I, you know, I, I began to, as I graduated and, and worked in different states, and then I landed in Michigan here conducting ecological surveys across the state, I was seeing sites that were like pictured here, right for oak regeneration. You know, it was very successful. There may have been a natural disturbance that like a fire or a uh, uh, ice storm or a blowdown or gypsy moth outbreak or other insect outbreak that opened up the canopy and under, the can under that canopy came up oak. And conversely, I was seeing more often uh, sites that look like this one, where the overstory is beautiful white oak and black oak, but the understory is completely dominated by red maple. And that's what you're seeing here. Almost all the greenery is red maple. In fact, when we sampled the site, we didn't find a single understory oak, even though the overstory is dominated by oak. That, by the way, is one of our field assistants, uh, Rachel Steele, uh, who helped conduct the sampling. Actually. This was in various decades. So, so I initiated a study, the DNR funded a study to look at oak regeneration and look at some of the management techniques and uh, help tease apart what was working, what wasn't, where what landscapes and what factors influence positive oak regeneration or failed oak regeneration. And I was able to hire, luckily hire Jeff Lee to help out with this. Jeff did the heavy lifting. He oversaw the field work for two summers, conducted the analysis, the statistical analysis with lots of help. And this is a 200 page report with, with lots of information. And uh, I think we're gonna have a link available for you. So, let me jump into how we did the study and what we found. We sampled 105 sites distributed across uh, the, north, the lower peninsula 
and um, stratified by, by ecoregions in northern and southern Michigan. We use Denny Albert's landscape ecoregions of Michigan, Minnesota, and Wisconsin to stratify our sampling. And we further stratified our sampling through um, uh, sampling on Sandy Lake Plain, Sandy Outwash, uh, ice contact topography or kettle pan topography, and coarse texture and moraine. So um, uh, hopefully you can see my cursor here. So this is an area of Lake Plain that's Sandy Lake Plain. Lake Plain is often under is, is, is often clay, and th what you're seeing here are old sh abandoned shorelines that were reworked by moving on the lake as the as glacier advanced and, and receded. So this is all blue lake plain, sandy lake plain here as well on the west side of Michigan. Here's the Grayling Outwash Plain, and you can see the outwash in this dark uh, brown in this brown texture and ice contact features. Um, and coarse and marine too. So um, oak is distributed in, in these features in predominantly in Michigan here. This is where oak is dominant. I'll say more about these things of where it comes as we move along. So our field sampling methods included uh, vegetation plot sampling of overstory, understory, and ground layer vegetation, measuring the heights of seedling and saplings, coring us. Uh, trees of distinct uh, cohorts, overstory and understory cohorts, and to produce a range class distribution for each site, measuring canopy closure, assessing deer browse, and uh, each site we dug a soil pit one meter deep, and uh, to look at uh, the underlying soil, whether that was clay and holding moisture, or whether it was sand allowing for excessive and well-drained soils. We also sent away uh, samples to the MSU soil samples of the a horizon or the topsoil to the MSU soil analysis lab, where they assessed phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium, and soil pH. And we also recorded aspect slope and position as well. So I'm jumping right into results. We saw um, major differences in soil between the northern and southern um, of Michigan. And uh, with the north having lower soil pH and lower nutrient values. So you can see quite a difference. Each of these uh, results is significant. And, but if you look at the soils map, it makes sense. This is a, a rough or coarse soil map. And um, so it's kind of lumping a lot of things together, but you can see these, sand, these sands uh, dominating much of Northern Michigan here on the Lake Plain, in the Grayling Outwash Plain, and then the Wago Outwash Plain in the long. Uh, the um, Southern Lake Michigan uh, Lake Plain here. And conversely, you can see the dominance of loamy soils in Southern Michigan. Loamy soils being a mixture of sand, silt, and clay holding up, holding moisture, um, not necessarily flooding, but holding enough moisture that plants can readily use that moisture and adding a lot of nutrients to the soil. So really, really much better soils here and also in the Cadillac and the Leeds ecoregion. So how does oak regeneration vary between north and south ecoregions? Well, in the north, we had greater regeneration of oak, but also greater regeneration of red maple. That makes sense partly because they're doing a lot of logging. So if you take off the overstory, you're going to get regeneration. So both we saw a greater regeneration of both oak and red maple. But we also saw statewide, or at least uh, through the lower peninsula, greater regeneration of red maple than oak. So, um, so red maple is doing great. Oak is doing well in some places and not in others. Well, where is it doing well? Oak regeneration is doing very well on sandy lake plains and sandy outwash plains uh, where there's deep sands, they're low nutrients, um, these are excessively well-drained landscapes, and oak seems to be uh, competitive in those environments. Um, where it is not, doesn't seem to be competitive or where red maple um, really lost is in, um, so where there are these finer textured soils. Hey, Mike. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. I, we're, we're having, I think, some trouble with your audio. So maybe if you could turn off your, your video, um, it might help with the internet connection if that's the issue. Sorry okay. to interrupt. 
No. We want to make sure we can hear you. Yeah, absolutely. Happy. And it might also just, I, I'm not sure if uh, where your mic microphone is, but um, we'll try that if you can speak into the microphone clearly and, and help clear that up. There's a few, uh, enough people are having some issues hearing you. So. Okay, hold on. Let me see if I'm, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can see the controls. And thanks for letting us know, everyone. We'll, we'll hopefully get this sorted out. It's definitely, um, as, as, as I said, we, we will be sharing some of Mike's resources as well, uh, but we'll try to um, get going here once he gets his uh, slides back up. Okay, so let me know if um, how, it, how it's working. So oak regeneration by landforms, but gradient oak, oak regeneration on the sand lake plains in the outwash in these very droughty, well-drained, um, acidic soils with low nutrients. Oak is doing well, um, but not on the moraines. Uh, oak loves rich soils, so there's not a problem there, but it looks like red maple is able to outcompete oak uh, readily on the moraines where there's some finer textured sediments and uh, the that retain a little bit of moisture and provide more nutrients. So here's an example um, of two shelter wood cut, cuts in, on different landforms on, um, in Mason County. So a shelter wood cut is a stage clear cut where instead of just cutting the forest, you know, the overstory at one time, they cut a portion of it and then wait some years, five, 10 years, and then come in and, and remove another portion, either the rest of it or another portion of the overstory. That gives the, time, the system time that gives the, the existing trees time to seed in. It allows a response from the understory. Um, and uh, it's a very common forest management practice for oaks. So um, these shelter wood cuts on an outwash plane, uh, you know, exhibited very good regeneration of white and black oak, but on a, on a um, end moraine, uh, it resulted in very little oak regeneration, but very good red maple sprouting um, from, from the forms of the existing red maples. So how is oak regeneration uh, responding to management overall um, across landforms statewide? Well, cutting is definitely stimulating both oak and red, red maple regeneration, but cutting followed by burning was more effective than either treatment alone. So, so um, the cutting by and then following up with burning stimulated the oak regeneration and helped reduce red maple abundance. So here's a site in Barry County on loamy sands on a on an El Moraine, and um, you can see here these are two black oaks that have resprouted. Uh, it's a common way to regenerate oak. oak Oak is able to re-sprout if it's cut um, when it's young. It was able to re-sprout, but there was a wildfire that went through this site about 10 years later and, and took out a lot of the red maple. This site is very good white oak and black oak regeneration and a low abundance of red maple. I'm gonna show you the next slide, which is just two miles away. It's a slide I showed you previously, two miles to the Northeast and the same moraine, same soils, and we did not find a single uh, oak in the understory in our sample plots of this site. Instead, it was dominated by red maple. This is an unbanished state, completely unbanished. The other one, they had implemented management in the late 60s, early 70s. So big difference. Um, uh, oak is responding positively to management. If you can control the red maples, that's helpful. So the factors that are contributing to successful oak regeneration based on the results of a logistic regression model where we put in lots of factors and simply said, what does the data say? Tell us what is significant of all the variables we collected. What is significant? Where, where is successful oak regeneration happening? Well, these are the variables that came up. Sandy lake plains and outwash plains with a low nutrient source. That um, is where I've been seeing oak regeneration my whole career. And uh, that's what the model said. Uh, low overstory and low understory basal area. In other words, um, where trees aren't huge, where there isn't a ton of trees, it's a relatively open canopy. And um, especially with the, when 
um, the basal area of red maple. So low ground coverage, low ground cover coverage, in other words, a sparse ground layer, a sparse shrub layer, and high oak seedling presence. So this is a recipe for success where we're unlikely to see oak regeneration following a fire, following a, um, a disturbance to the canopy, could be a kind of ice storm, uh, a wind throw, or insect outbreak. In, we're unlikely to see oak regeneration under those circumstances on ice contact or marine landforms with heavier soils, loams, sandy loams, silt loams, sandy clay loams. So these are the soil types that we have in Ann Arbor. So, well, um, in, in much of Southern Michigan. We're gonna address, uh, come back to that, that thought in a few slides. So under good initial conditions prior to management, um, or I should say good initial conditions prior to management are essential for oak regeneration. So these would include a semi-open canopy, advanced oak regeneration in the understory. In other words, there's already oak in the understory that if the canopy is disturbed or, or under forced management practice, there's a, a, there are already oaks that will assume that canopy position. Few red maple stems in the understory and overstory. That is really uh, important. High oak seedling abundance and low shrub abundance. So these are conditions that dictate successful restoration. And under those conditions, a cut will encourage uh, oak regeneration. This was up on the Sand Lake Plain in uh, Aranac, a county up on Lake here along Lake Huron uh, and the Huron Manistee National Forest. We had really good oak regeneration following a, a shelter would cut on loamy sand soils on the, on the Sand Lake Plain. Under four initial conditions, four initial conditions would be dense red maple or dense sugar maple or a dense overstory of other any species other than oaks or a dense shrub layer. And under poor initial conditions, a single burn or a cut will encourage regeneration of other species. And here you're seeing lots of red maple re-sprouting following, following a cut. So statewide, we can take a step back and we could, if you know, we have limited resources, we could prioritize restoration and management efforts on sites with the highest probability of success. And again, those are those droughty landforms with low soil nutrients that already have advanced rate oak regeneration. And they have semi-open canopies and few red maples in the understory. But, but this leaves out a lot of Southern Michigan, a lot of the state um, in counties such as Livingston and Oakland and Washington, Jackson, Calhoun, Kalamazoo, and Berry County and Kent County. So um, where we have beautiful oak forests, and this is an example of one of those um, oak dominated overstory, but it's thick understory. And if, if uh, forest management practices, we went in and, and tried to log the site, and I've seen a lot of this, um, it doesn't work it, it, at all. It, it, you get almost no, little to no oak regeneration. So we need to take an ecological approach in this landscape. So where we have heavier textured soils, like the loams, the sandy loams, clay loams, silt loams, um, in those conditions, we need to initiate and sustain efforts to control maples and invasive shrubs prior to cutting. So we're not just creating um, a mass quantity of red maple and other shade tolerant species. Um, we need to go in there before we can manipulate the forest canopy and uh, control those uh, maples and, and shrubs beforehand. We can also use standard forest practices like uh, locating existing oak saplings and understory trees and removing nearby competitors. That is done uh, routinely in the Northern hardwoods in Northern Michigan, Northern Wisconsin for sugar maple. You would find the sugar maples you wanna keep, uh, thin or remove the hard other species around them. Uh, so these are the trees, these are our prized trees. And we allow that we um, we allow those trees to continue to grow into the canopy. Uh, we can conduct prescribed burns on frequent rotation, one to five years, while protecting existing oak saplings and understory trees from fire. So um, that will allow thinning of that uh, of that shrub layer, thinning of the understory over time, 
um, and provide room and begin to slowly open up the canyon. Lastly, reducing, and not, not uh, to diminish this, but reducing regional deer density, densities is really critical. Uh, so that if, if we're not able to do that, it's going to be different, difficult to get those seedlings up to the sapling layer where they're above the browse line. And you know, it, it's, it would be an intense process to cage seedlings um, where we can't reduce your regional deer densities, but that's another option. So I want to thank Jeff Lee, my co-author, for doing a lot of the heavy lifting on this and uh, lots of other collaborators and folks have done with the study and with the amount of funding. I want to thank you for showing up and being here today. So, and thanks for the opportunity to speak. Well, thank you, Mike. Um, we, we, you know, we're sorry for the, the initial uh, audio issues, but it sounded real clear after that. And we had a lot of great, good, great questions coming through. Um, we're going to do our best to, to answer, uh, have some Q&A time at the end of the presentations. Um, and so please uh, keep those Q&As coming in and, and we'll, we'll do our best to answer as many as we can. Um, and so for next presentation, we have Doug Tallamy. Uh, he probably needs little introduction for many of us, uh, as we're many fans of his books. Um, Doug is the T.A. Baker Professor of Agriculture in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware, where he has authored 106 research publications, has taught insect-related courses for 41 years, and chief among his research goals is to better understand the many ways insects interact with plants and how such interactions determine the diversity of animal communities. Uh, let's see here. So welcome, Doug. Um, tonight, he'll be presenting on his, his latest book, The Nature of Oaks. And so we'll hand it over to Doug here. Hey, thank you, Doug. <clears throat> All right, now, now that we know how to regenerate oaks, I'm gonna talk about uh, the things that will use those oaks once you have regenerated them. And I'm going to do it from a perspective of the oaks that we put into our yard when we moved into our house in the year 2000. Uh, we got a piece of a property from a farm that was broken up into 10 acre lots and it had been mowed for hay before it was broken up. So very, very few plants there and certainly no oaks and very few woody plants, period. So our goal was to regenerate the, regenerate, I'm using that word, to restore the biodiversity or at least some of it that used to be on this site a long time ago. Well, we moved in in July and that September, uh, a couple of white oaks about a mile and a half down the road uh, produced uh, good, good acorn crops. So we got some of those acorns and we planted them. Of course, white oaks germinate in the fall. They send down a single root radical and that's all they do in the fall. But then in the spring, they pop up uh, and that's pretty much all they do, or at least it looks like that's all they do. They just sit there. And this helps give oaks the, the uh, reputation of being very slow growers. They're not actually growing slowly. They're just doing most of their growth underground that first year. Oaks grow 10 times more root biomass underground than leaf biomass. So uh, that's a critical period of their life where they're establishing roots that will support them for hundreds of years after that. Here's our little oak in, in year two. It's got a deer cage around it. Uh, we have Boy, this morning I had about 12 deer in the driveway, I had to get permission to, to leave. Um, so we got a big deer problem. And if you don't cage something they're they're gone. But we're gonna follow this tree. That's what it looked like in year two. This is what it looked like 18 years later. It's 45 feet tall, 47 inch circumference, canopy spread of 30 feet. It's still a baby, of course, but it's a real landscape tree. So you don't have to wait forever to get a real tree, even if you plant them from acorns. And one of the points I want to make today, probably the primary point, is that oaks really are a lifeline to countless, countless species. There's dozens of species of birds that depend on oaks. Uh, a number of, of uh, mammals, rodents, bears, and the big ones, the, the oaks that have big uh, hollow centers, the bears will spend the winter there, raccoons, possums, not that many uh, reptiles are associated with oaks, but there are uh, several butterfly species that specialize on them, hundreds of species of moths that depend on oaks, as well as their predators and parasitoids. Uh, Cynipid gall wasps, specialists, uh, those gall makers on oaks, very important. A number of beetles, June beetles, longhorn beetles, metallic wood boring beetles, weevils. Uh, then you have uh, a whole community 
using the oak leaf litter that's underneath your oak, including lots of spiders and centipedes and other predators, arthropods, mollusks, annelids, all kinds of things are living under there. Problem is that this diverse web of life uh, that is associated with almost every oak that is out there is, is uh, un, unappreciated and well unnoticed and therefore unappreciated by the people that have oaks in their yards. And that is exactly why I wrote the book, The Nature of Oaks. Uh, it is a month by month guide to the life that is probably associated with the oak in your yard. And I wrote it because I wanted to provide the knowledge that generates interest. Typically knowledge generates interest and interest often leads to compassion. Uh, and in my view, we need a lot more compassion towards the natural world these days. First, a few facts. Uh, the genus Quercus contains 91 species in North America, 435 species globally. The word Quercus comes from the Celtic quer, meaning fine, and quez meaning tree. So oaks are fine trees. There are four major taxonomic uh, sections in the genus in North America. The white oak group, Quercus. The red oak group, Lobedi. The live oak group, Verentes and a much smaller canyon oak group, Protobalanus in the West. This is the distribution of oaks uh, everywhere except the brown areas here. There's at least one species of oak that uh, is, is uh, often very common. The center of distribution is down here in the Southeast where you can have a number of species of, of oaks. But uh, except in the high Rockies and the very driest uh, plains, uh, we have oaks in the landscape. And they can live a long, long time. 900 year average life cycle for a healthy oak, 300 years of growth, 300 years of stasis and 300 years of decline. And during each one of those periods of, of growth, uh, they're delivering unique ecological uh, benefits, contributions to the, to the local landscape. So when you hear somebody say, I've got a hundred year oak in, in my yard, it's a baby, it's not ready to die. The reason they don't live that long in so many places is because we've, we've done something bad to them. It's typically their root system. It, the roots run into a foundation or a, a sewer line or a roadway someplace, and you, you take away the roots, you're going to shorten the lifespan of the oak. Everybody wants to know what the oldest oak is in the country. Uh, a lot of people will say it's the Middleton oak, a southern live oak. It's 1,500 years old. And I can't ever remember whether it's in Charlotte or Charleston, but it's down south and it is, it is a big fella. But there are oaks that are practically ground covers. The Palmer Oak, for example, in California, just creeps along the ground. It clones itself as it goes. And, and this particular specimen was dated at 13,000 years old. So if you're really looking at age, these little unimpressive guys are much older. This is the Y Oak in Y, Maryland. It's not with us anymore, but it was the largest white oak in the country. And as you can see, it was a very impressive tree. I got to see it before it fell over. Well, it's probably been 15, almost 20 years at this point. But uh, one of the points I wanna make tonight is that not all oaks are massive and you can use them in small landscapes if you choose the right species. Another very important point that I will stress is that oaks have superior ecological function. They have the highest biodiversity value, meaning they are supporting more life. They're sequestering more carbon, pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, tying it up in their tissues, pumping the extra carbon into the soil through their root systems. Extremely important ecosystem service today. Uh, they're the best soil stabilizers because they've got those huge root systems. They're making the best leaf litter. It's the best because it lasts the longest. Uh, and all of those things promote healthier watersheds. I started the book in October and people want to know why I started in October. I started in October because that's when my wife, Cindy said, you should write a book about oaks. And it was October. Uh, and this is what my oak looked like. I looked out the window and said, all right, we'll write a book about oaks. October, of course, is when you're going to notice acorns more than any other month. Um, that's when they're actively dropping. They've been on the tree for a number of months, but we, we typically don't pay attention to them. Uh, and of course, oaks can produce a lot of acorns. A single oak tree can make up to 3 million acorns in its lifetime. And those are, those are important packages of food. Very rich in fats, very rich in protein, and they're supporting an awful lot of creatures. A number of rodents depend on, on uh, acorns. And again, those big guys do too. Bears eat a lot of acorns. Of course, those cute squirrels and those cute deer. We know about the deer. But a lot of birds do too. Um, turkeys really love acorns. If, if you've got an oak mast in the, the fall, your turkey population really responds. But red belly woodpeckers, tip mice, towhees, uh, nuthatches, uh, flickers, all of these guys are, are eating acorns. 
And ducks, particularly wood ducks, they really love acorns. Any, any acorn that falls into the, the water, the duck will dive down and get it, or they'll come up on the land and just gobble them down. Number of inverte invertebrates depend on acorns as well. This is the acorn weevil. That's the larva tunneling out of the acorn. That's what the adult looks like. Uh, and it can be really common in acorns. This is the acorn moth. It's actually a species complex. Uh, there are several species here. They all look identical, so it's tough to tell which species you have. But the caterpillar develops in the oak and then, then tunnels out. So a couple of weeks after the acorns drop from a tree, you look under a tree and it's utter devastation. I mean, everything, all the good acorns are gone or squashed or chewed into. And you might wonder how oaks ever successfully reproduce with all the things that are eating those acorns. And this is where a very ancient mutualism between jays all over the world and oaks all over the world comes into play. Both the jay lineage and the oak lineage uh, evolved at about the same time, about 65 million years ago in Southeast Asia. So they're both very old uh, lineages and they started to interact right away. Jays, of course, get food from oaks in the form of those, those acorns. But the way they use that food allows oaks to move farther and faster than any other tree genus in the world. So this is how it, how it, how it works. Jays are storing those acorns for winter food. They don't cache them. So they're not piling a whole bunch in, in a single area like some of uh, the acorn dispersers do, but they bury them singly. They'll pick up a, an acorn and then they'll fly up to a mile from the parent tree. And that's the key. Uh, because that's farther than any other acorn disperser is going to move an acorn. And they tap it below the surface of the ground, typically where you've got a disturbance, so the tapping is easy. Now, if a jay thinks that another jay has watched them bury an acorn, they'll hang around for a few minutes, then they'll dig up that acorn and move it. Because jays know that jays steal acorns. And then, of course, during the wintertime, uh, they're going to go find those acorns and have something to eat. Well, a single jay can bury up to 4,500 acorns each fall. They're working very hard as long as those acorns are available. But the key is they only remember where one out of every four of those acorns are. So a single jay can actually plant 3,360 oak trees each year. And that's what allows those, those uh, trees to move farther or faster, to disperse faster than any other tree genus. Because remember, the, the jay is moving the acorn up to a mile from the parent tree. It's not just blue jays that have this relationship. All the species of jays do. This is a scrub jay in, in Oregon, but right down through Central America um, and across Eurasia, jays are moving acorns. Another bird is uh, very specialized on acorns, and that's the acorn woodpecker in the southwest. It's a very beautiful bird. And what they do, they don't bury acorns for the winter. They, they um, adopt a tree, a snag, a dead tree, and then they, they tunnel out, peck out little uh, acorn holders. So depressions in the tree, and here's an acorn that they uh, store there. <clears throat> and then they stuff it full of acorns, and then they can retrieve those all winter long. Uh, these trees become very valuable. That's stuck in there, become very valuable because you can have up to 50,000 holes ready to receive acorns. It takes a long time to do that. And, and those uh, in the Southwest, those trees last a long time. So family units of, of acorn woodpeckers protect a tree like this, <clears throat> keep everybody else away. And then they've got access to all of these acorns. If you have an acorn tree in your yard, it's enormously entertaining. November is when you might have recognized that there were either a lot of acorns that year or very few. There's often not much in between. And when you have a lot, it's called a mast year. So typically within one of those taxonomic sections within the white oak group or the, the uh, red oak group, um, all the members will make their acorns at the same time. Uh, it's called a mast and it's an unusual form of, of reproduction. So of course ecologists try to explain why are oaks so variable in their, in their reproduction? Why do they make a ton of acorns one year and then almost none uh, the next year or very few? Well, there's four hypotheses and they're not mutually exclusive. Predator satiation, predator reduction, improved pollination and energy partitioning. Predator satiation. Uh, acorn predators, acorn, the things that eat acorns, like the acorn weevil, can get really numerous. You can have 90% of your acorns inhabited by acorn weevils. <clears throat> and if, eggs, if oaks made the same number of acorns every single year, 
the population of these guys would stabilize around that number and they'd eat them almost every single one. That's true for the squirrels and, and the, the, the mice, all the other things that are depending on oak acorns. But if you make a lot of acorns one year, the population of these acorn predators explodes. You got a lot of acorn weevils, a lot of acorn moles, a lot of, lot of squirrels. And then the next year you make almost no acorns. That reduces the population. Then there's starvation. The squirrel population drops, the acorn weevils disappear. Uh, and then you go several years with very few acorns and then another mashed year. So you're swamping the number of things that eat acorns when you finally get that mashed year again. And it's that highly irregular production of acorns. And it's unpredictable too, by the way, that keeps the predators always off, off balance. They can never be have the right number at the right time to eat all of the acorns. Improved pollination. Oaks are wind pollinated. That's a game of chance. You're releasing your, your pollen on the wind and whether or not it hits a female flower depends really on how much pollen is out there. So if you get a lot of trees reduce, releasing pollen at once, um, you have a better chance at pollination. And finally, energy allocation. And by the way, if you're wondering whether oaks can have good fall color, this is the scarlet oak. It's one of the oaks that can have really good fall color. Energy allocation. There's never enough energy to go around. So oaks divvy it up either for growth, they'll grow a lot one year, or for reproduction, they'll make a lot of acorns in one year but rarely do they do both at the same time. So again, those four hypotheses can be operating at the same time and all of them uh, combined can explain why we have oak masts. Okay, December is when you might notice uh, another peculiar feature of oaks, particularly the white oak group. Uh, and that is that uh, many of the trees, particularly younger trees and particularly lower branches on younger trees do not drop their leaves. They hold their leaves all winter. That's called uh, marcescence. Uh, and and uh, it's another very curious thing. Why are the, these deciduous trees not dropping their leaves like other deciduous trees do? Again, a couple of hypotheses, but the most uh, popular one is that uh, it wasn't long ago uh, when we had some really large Pleistocene mammals that were common, not just in North America, but across, the, uh, well, across most of the world, actually. This is the group of mammals that was in Mexico alone. So three species of mammoths, the giant sloth that could reach up 18 feet, um, a number of species that were browsers. That's what a, a white-tailed deer is today. It's one of the few browsers we have left. And by browsing, I mean, they're not out in your lawn eating grass. They're, they're uh, particularly during the wintertime eating woody material. And it's usually the buds at the end of the branches that are going to be next year's growth. That's where the nutrients are. Well. The idea is that if oaks keep the dead leaves of the previous year around those buds, it's very hard to eat those buds without getting a mouthful of something that's really distasteful. And the distribution of those leaves uh, supports that hypothesis because they're only in the lower branches. When you go up about 18 feet, no more marcescence. And that was as, as high as those mammals could reach. Difficult to prove for sure, but it sure makes a good story. And that uh, marcescence gives oaks a landscape trait that uh, most other deciduous trees don't have. And that is they can be good screens even in the winter time. So if you don't like your neighbor and you wanna screen them out, you can plant a white oak and you'll get a good, good screen um, throughout the entire year. January, cold. Very few people are out staring at their oaks in January, but if you do, particularly on a nice day, um, look up in the branches, you often see tiny birds, things like chickadees and tip mice flitting around the branches. You know, they're not flitting for fun. Uh, it looks like they're looking for food. But of course, these are the birds that come to our feeders and they're eating seeds. So we, we know that they're looking for seeds, but there are no seeds up in the oak tree. Well, it turns out that the chickadees and tip mice and, and uh, several other small birds, um, they're eating seeds during the wintertime, but only 50% of their diet is seeds. And birds like the uh, golden crown kinglet, they don't eat seeds at all. They are 100% insectivorous. Uh, and, and they really should have migrated because there are not enough insects in the wintertime, particularly up in our trees where these guys are hunting, to sustain a little bird that needs to eat all day long. And that is the kinglet paradox. What are these little insectivores doing here? They should have migrated where insect populations remain high all winter long. Well, Bern Heinrich uh, is one of the great naturalists that is uh, left, um, don't have many anymore. He doesn't like paradoxes, so he looked in the crops of golden crown kinglets in Maine in January, and he found they were full of caterpillars. 
where are they getting the caterpillars? The caterpillars are up there, particularly in those oak trees. They're just sitting there all winter long. There's a caterpillar, there's a caterpillar. They look like sticks. Most of them are in the family Geometridae, the inchworms. Uh, when it gets really cold, uh, antifreeze proteins in their cells keep their, their cells from bursting. And so they, they shrink a little bit. And then when it gets warm, they expand a little bit. But um, they make it through the winter without any problem. And there's no more kinglet paradox. We know what the kinglets are doing up there. They're eating these caterpillars. What we don't know is what the caterpillars are doing up there. Most insects ever winter as eggs. Uh, which means in the springtime they have to hatch out and they're really, really tiny and it, they grow slowly. Or they overwinter as adults or as chrysalids or pupae and they've got to emerge and then mate with each other and then lay those eggs and then the little guys hatch out. If you're a, a uh, almost a mature caterpillar, these guys are going to grow a little bit more, but not much. And you spend the winter that way. When the leaves burst forth in the spring, you have a tremendous competitive advantage against any other leaf eater. So you essentially have unlimited food in the spring if you can make it through the winter and dodge all of those, uh, those foraging birds. Okay, February. February uh, biologically is the quietest time of year. So it's a good time to look at what I call oak landscaping myths. Now, typically with myths, there is some fact associated and then the myth grows around it. At least that's the way it was in the old days. Um, but here, you know, I hear this all the time. Oaks are too expensive to use. They grow too slowly to use as landscape plants. They're too big to use on small lots. Uh, if we do use them, they're going to fall over and crush our house. They're going to lift up your sidewalk or your driveway. Um, fact or fiction? Let's look at each one of these. Are oaks too expensive to use? Well, they can be if you insist on planting a large oak. Uh, there are large oaks out there that cost you $3,000. And, you know, we, we're addicted to instant gratification. People want their trees to be instantly in the landscape without any growing at all. So nurserymen have figured out how to grow them in pots. Um, there used to be a problem with, with uh, root, root binding, and there still can be. You've got to be a responsible nursery room where the roots just go around and around and around the pot. If you plant a tree like this, those roots will continue to grow and strangle each other, and that tree will not live very long. But um, there's something called air pots, I think they're called, and it allows the, the roots to develop without becoming root, root bound. But the amount of root mass available for a tree this size is, is not nearly enough. So when you plant the tree, uh, it spends a long time growing the, the roots necessary to continue growth. The other option, oh, this is, this is a plant I ran to uh, a couple of years ago in Newark, Delaware. I think there were 15 oak trees and they insisted on planting old ones and or large one, and every single one died. So there is a risk associated with these big trees. You have to do it right. And, and um, this is the other option, the bald and burlap, where the roots are essentially cut off. You cut off most of the roots, you tie it up in burlap. Uh, it makes a tidy little bundle there. But look, it is really hard on those, those trees. If I plant an acorn or a small oak right here, right the same day I plant one of these bald or burlap trees, um, this guy in 10 years is going to be bigger and happier and healthier, much healthier than, than these guys. When you put them in the ground, they've got to rebuild that root mass, and it often does take a full decade. So yeah, you've got a tree that big, but it's not growing, and the mortality is typically high. This is the size that you ought to be planting your, your oaks. Um, and it's hard to buy oaks like this because then the nurseryman can't charge you a lot of money, but you can make your own pretty easily. You find the acorns and germinate them under the right conditions. But if you do that, are you going to suffer from that problem of oaks growing too slowly? Well, let's look at that. How slowly do they grow? Let's have a race between uh, the white oak I put in, in my yard. So here it is. Uh, it's six years old here. Let's have a race between this, this uh, white oak and my little friend, Bella. She's two years old. And no, she's not my daughter. She's just my little friend. Um, she really liked this oak tree. She spent a lot of time at, at our house. Now the oak has a head start. It might not be fair, but it's a white oak. We all know they grow really, really slowly. So here it is at six years old, seven years old, eight years old, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and there's 2020, Bella is, or the tree is 20 years old and Bella's got her mask on so we know what year it is. Uh, she has clearly lost the race. So after that slow period in the beginning, the, the oak takes off and grows as fast as any other tree. So I'm gonna say that that is largely a myth. Our oaks do not grow too slowly. 
um, when we treat their root systems really well. And you don't have to wait decades or hundreds of years for your oak to start to contribute ecologically in a very valuable way to your landscape by, by supporting the caterpillars that run the food webs in your landscape. This is a pin oak that has just popped its head above the leaves and here's a caterpillar standing on the ground eating the leaves of that, that tree. So they'll start to contribute energy that they've captured from the sun and turned into food almost immediately. Are oaks too large to use in small yards? Well, you're not going to get a landscape designer or landscape architect anywhere to recommend trees this big in a yard this small. Uh, but, you know, in the old days, they didn't worry about that. These are two big red oaks that were probably planted when this house was built. And I'm sure it's more than 100 years ago. Remember, 100 years ago, there was no air conditioning. So these oaks lowered the temperature of that house by 10 degrees, very valuable ecosystem service. Uh, but, and they haven't fallen over and crushed the house and they haven't lifted up the hardscape. But again, uh, you're not gonna find anybody to recommend that. Here's a very large oak next to a very large church. Um, pretty sure the oak was, was there when they built the church. And fortunately they didn't cut it, cut it down. But again, it's not, you know, just not gonna get anybody to recommend that. Point I wanna make here is that we do have small oak options. Um, in the East, we've got dwarf chestnut oak, Quercus prinoides. That's the one that's most commonly in the trade. If you go a little farther south, the Georgia oak is in and out of the trade. Dwarf live oak is um, the giant majestic live oaks. In the south, we've got a dwarf variety, Quercus virginianum minima. Uh, in the west, there are a number of more options. Um, the the uh, yellow highlighted ones are just the species that are in Texas alone. Um, now, we've, there's not many of these are in the trade because uh, remember, nurserymen have thought that plants that the public only wants plants for decorations. And many of these are small, they're not that decorative. So why would we sell them? Well, now the, the public is actually looking for plants that have ecological value and oaks are right up there at the top. So getting smaller oaks into the trade is, is something we really wanna push. This is a, chink of, or a dwarf chestnut oak in, in my yard. It makes acorns when it's five feet tall. Here's another option and that's to create uh, oak coppices. A coppice, of course, is when you let a tree grow up, maybe three or four inch diameter, cut it off at the base, and it will come back as a shrub. Um, so I don't know if this is a red oak or a, or a schumard oak, uh, but it's an oak shrub because uh, of the coppicing. Now, I don't, I, you know, I took this off the web. I don't know anybody who's actually doing this, but it is an option for getting oaks into your yard when you have a very small yard. You can get the valuable oak foliage, which is really important for the, the food web. And I'd love to see people try this. You can cut it off as long as you want. Uh, so, you know, 100 years of coppicing. People used to do that a lot. They, they use the small stems for lots of things. So it is an option that we're not taking advantage of. Okay, are oaks gonna fall over and crush your house? Maybe. Uh, and it often depends on how we, we actually plant the trees. We tend to plant all of our trees as if they are specimen plants. We want them to be giant and grand and not compete with any other tree. So we separate them from other trees, no competition for light or water, which means the root system cannot interlock with anything else. So you get a, a, a windy, wet period and boom, over they go. This is the way trees typically grow in the forest. They grow close enough so that the root systems are interlocked with each other. It's extremely, uh, an extremely stable matrix that keeps these trees from blowing over under most conditions. Here's a stream cut near my house. There are one, two, three, four trees. All their roots are really interlocked. You're not gonna blow those guys over. Tornado might snap them off, but there's no landscaping trick that's gonna protect you from tornadoes. So rather than this, how about this? These are the two trees we got our original acorns from uh, when we first moved in. That's about three feet separating them. Uh, they planted themselves naturally. Nobody planted them. This road was put in afterwards. Now, neither, these are white oaks. Neither one is as majestic as it would be if it were alone, but they're there. They haven't blown over. So we can, we have to adjust our eyes to looking at trees as groups or little groves. Here's uh, three oak trees in uh, Northwest Connecticut called the Three Sisters. Again, uh, very close together. And this is, is a planned landscape at Mount Cuba Center in Hocus and Deller. It's one of the DuPont estates and it's dedicated to native plants. It's a big red oak in the back. These are hemlocks in the front and, and uh, big rhododendrons down here, some hardscape. It's a planned landscape, but it's extremely stable. All these trees are interlocking with each other. So it doesn't have to be the same species. 
It looks natural. It's providing habitat. If you have three or four acres of lawn and you're wondering what the heck can I do with it, create a little, a little uh, tree grove like this with, with oaks or different species of trees. You're creating habitat. You're stabilizing those trees. You're getting a, a three-dimensional landscape and it's still beautiful. Are oaks gonna lift up your, your uh, hardscape? Uh, well, they could, depending on what you plant them over. This is a pin oak. Uh, and look, it is not lifting up the, the driveway, the uh, little road here at all. If you plant it over bedrock, though, the roots are going to go laterally and they'll lift up anything. If you plant it over agricultural pan, where the plow went down 15 inches for 100 years and compacted the soil underneath it uh, so it's rock hard, again, the roots will go laterally. So if you live over uh, an old ag field and you know you've got pan down there, break it up and then the roots will go deep. These are two red oaks at the University of, of Delaware. Big trees, not touching that, that uh, curb at all. So it is not at all a given that your oak trees are gonna lift up your hardscape. Um, there are species that I would avoid like uh, willow oak. You're not gonna plant willow oak in, in uh, Michigan anyway. Uh, and it's funny because willow oaks all over Washington, D.C., and they just don't worry about this. So I guess it's not as big of a problem as we make it out to be. OK, enough of, of oak myths. Let's let's talk about what happens when those leaves finally start dropping, which would be mid to late March. Marcescence is over. The leaves are falling. Let's talk about those leaves. There's a tremendous amount of morphological variability in, in oak leaves. Now, this is just a smattering of the uh, oak species that we have out there, but we've got um, all kinds of leaf shapes. Here's the one looks like a willow oak or willow leaf. That's the willow oak. Um, this, this looks like a holly. That's an emery oak from the southwest. This is, uh, I think it's a gamble oak from um, Colorado. Juvenile leaves are bigger than, than uh, adult leaves. We've got pointed lobes, we've got rounded lobes, all kinds of variation out there. And a single tree can make a lot of leaves, 700,000 leaves on one oak tree. And if you, if you put them right next to each other, line them up, that'll cover four tennis courts. And that is one of their jobs. It's to cover the ground and, and keep the moisture in the ground to protect the soil community because all the members of the soil community require high humidity. The other job is to return the nutrients that that oak used that tree to the soil. And this is true for any tree so that it can be broken down by all those soil organisms and taken up by the tree again. You have a closed nutrient system. When we rake our leaves away or burn them or, or just throw them away, we've just thrown away all the nutrients that, um, I won't say burning, if you burn it and the ashes go straight down, the nutrients remain. But if you rake them up and throw them, throw them away, you've just thrown away the nutrients your tree needs in, in future years. Um, and you've also removed that protective layer that maintains the soil humidity. There are more species that live underground than above ground and certainly more, more individuals. And a lot of people worry that if they, if they leave their leaf litter, the oak, oak leaves that fall on their flower beds, none of the plants will be able to get through. But look, this is a, a, a we'll call it a fern garden, although it's totally natural, nobody planted it. These guys are coming through the normal layers of, of oak leaves, no problem at all. Now, if you pile your leaves up and get five feet thick, of course, it's gonna, not gonna uh, allow any plants to come through. But normal leaf loads, no problem. In a single square meter of, of soil and, and humus underneath your oak tree, you can have 250,000 mites per square meter, 100,000 springtails. This is a spinthurid uh, springtail, columbolin. 90,000 protorans. Those are tiny little primitive insects. You need a microscope to see them well. A million nematodes, a lot of life under there. And those guys are all working together to break down those leaves, return the nutrients to the soil so that the, the uh, roots can take them up again. And there's some very pretty things that depend on oak leaf litter, like the banded hair streak, the caterpillar develops on leaves like this on the ground. Very hard to find those caterpillars, but the adults are, are pretty common. If we rake these leaves away, we've just thrown out everything that the banded hair streak needs and actually several species of hair streaks. And there are 70 species of what we call litter moths. These are moths where the caterpillar develops on dead leaves on the ground. Things like the ambiguous litter moth, 
the American idea, the dark spotted palthus, and 67 other species. Tremendous amount of life that you're throwing away when you get rid of the leaves on your, on your property. When you see the, the white-throated sparrows or the juncos and, and um, towhees and other, other birds that are foraging on the ground, they're doing this little dance, pushing the leaves aside. They're trying to find the, the larvae and, and pupae of these guys. Um, so that's what they're living off all, all winter long. And then, of course, you have the predators, uh, the number of beetles and spiders and centipedes that are eating all of those guys. It's a very vibrant community. I'm, I'm thinking about oak litter, leaf litter the way we think about water now. When water falls in your property, we want every drop to stay in your property. We don't want any runoff. So we landscape in a way that holds that water in place until it can infiltrate. Same thing with these leaves. When leaves fall on your property, they all should stay in your property. Uh, and, and so they can return the nutrients and provide all those valuable ecosystem services. April is a time when buds break uh, and, and uh, the new year really starts to happen. And it's also the time that you have a chance to see one of the most ephemeral biological interactions that occurs in all of, of uh, nature. It lasts about five minutes a year. And I'm talking about when sinipid gall wasps lay their eggs in the buds of galls. So here's a, a sinipid female. It's a little tiny little wasp. That's the ovipositor. And what she's doing is injecting an egg into this bud. This is a male uh, sinipid who has mated with her already. So he's fathered the egg she's injecting in here, but he's hanging on to her because he wants to mate with her again um, because she's gonna lay another egg and he wants to be the father of that egg as well. This is a male who wishes he was this male. So here she is, she's laying her egg. She's not only injecting the egg into the bud, but she's injecting plant hormones into that bud as well. The cells in this, this meristematic tissue here are essentially like stem cells. You can, you can make them do anything you want with the proper chemistry. So what she wants them to do is grow into a gall that will protect her offspring. Uh, and people liken galls to cancerous growths, but I don't like that analogy at all because cancerous growths are uncontrolled growth. This is highly controlled growth. It's a compromise between the, the uh, plant hormones that she injects into the bud and what the, the uh, oak tree wants as well. And what results is a species specific gall uh, that you can recognize whatever species this is based on the shape of the gall. Here's a, a different species of galler uh, in my yard laying an egg last spring. And there's the gall that uh, uh, resulted from that. I put a little string around it so I could follow it. A lot of species of gallers out there, 5,000 species of sinipid gallers worldwide. A single oak tree can support 70 different species of, of gallers. And a number of these galls are, are hollow. It's very strange. This is the apple oak gall or the oak apple gall. You can see it written both ways. And if you cut it open, it is largely hollow. There's a central disc and the, the sinipid galler is in, in there as a little larva. And then you've got all this air and then you've got the outside of the gall. What is that morphology all about? Well, it has a purpose. It turns out that sinipids, sinipid gallers, have more parasitoids, more natural enemies, other wasp species that are laying their eggs into those larval sinipids than any other type of insect. So there's tremendous uh, pressure on these sinipids to protect those, those larvae. And they do it by creating a gall where the inner space between the, the galler and the outside of the gall is bigger than the ovipositor of these these uh, parasitoids. This is a pterymid parasitoid. Uh, and if uh, that space is bigger than the length of that overpositor, she can't reach the galler to lay her egg. She can reach it as the gall is expanding when that space isn't that big, but it's a very brief period of time. This is uh, another pterymid, Pterymus californicus. It's got the longest ovipositor out there, and it has created the largest gall we have in North America on uh, Quercus gariana, the uh, Oregon oak. Um, so it's got to be big, otherwise her ovipositor would be able to reach uh, those little guys that are hiding within. A lot of variation in, in galls that are out there. Some of them are quite beautiful. Others look like uh, types of plant diseases. There are 536 species of plant galls west of the Rockies. Most of them are sinipids and most of them are on oaks. Some grow on the leaves, some grow on the stems, some look like candy, uh, some look like that. Some really do look like plant diseases. Some look like spindles or whatever that is, more candy. This is one in my yard. This is, uh, looks like a little, little pottery. Here's, here's my favorite, uh, little gnome house. 
Um, some look like brains. This is a really strange one. There are four galls on a single oak leaf, uh, but look at all the, the gallers that emerge from these single galls. I don't know, 75, 80 from each one of these, these galls. So that's a very productive leaf right there. And galls have an interesting history, uh, an interesting part in human history, I should say, at least recorded history. Because if you grind up this gall and combine it with particular chemicals, it makes an indelible black ink. And that is the ink that human history has been recorded uh, with for thousands of years. The Bible was written with gall ink. The Magna Carta was written with gall ink. The Declaration of Independence was written with gall ink. All of the writings of the, the monks and scribes in the Middle Ages was written with, with gall ink. Handy piece of trivia if you're into, into galls. Okay, May, this is when the leaves fully expand and, and the, the new year really takes off. And of course, following the expansion of leaves all over the temperate zone comes the caterpillars that uh, eat those leaves. Big flush of caterpillars. And following the flush of those caterpillars comes the birds that eat those caterpillars. It is no coincidence that our migrating birds follow uh, the, the um, explosion of those caterpillars in the temperate zone, because that is what fuels the migration and it also fuels their reproduction once they get up here. And it's also no coincidence that particularly our warblers are gonna be found most often, often on oaks. I had a, uh, a student, Christy Beal, some years ago, look at the amount of time that warblers spent foraging on uh, various tree families. So here's the Fagaceae, that's where the oaks are. The oaks, the beeches, and the chestnuts, these were big trees in, in cemeteries. Well, there were no chestnuts and beeches in her study. So this was really all oaks versus pines versus birches uh, and so on. And what you see is that they're, they're spending most of their time on the oaks. Why? Because that's where the food is. Remember, there are no seeds and there are no berries in the spring when the birds are migrating uh, north. <clears throat> so all they're getting to feel their migration is these insects, primarily caterpillars. Things like the purple crested slug, the buck moth, the white marked tussock moth, the saddle prominent, double line prominent, white dotted prominent, the checkered fringe prominent, the laugher, the lace cap caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the skiff moth, the white blotch heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the banded tussock moth, the red line panopoda, the yellow neck caterpillar, the smaller parasa, the unicorn caterpillar, the crown slug, the streak dagger moth, the epilated dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the red humped oak worm, the orange humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the confused wood grain, the spiny oak slug, and my favorite, the spun glass slug. They're called slug caterpillars because their head is tucked up underneath. They're not slugs at all. And then hundreds of other species are on oaks. Uh, this is what our house looks like uh, in the summertime. These days, we put a lot of plants back. Uh, and our research has shown that caterpillars are what's driving the local food web because they are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. So counting the number of caterpillars in your food web is a good index for how healthy that food web is. And that's what I've been doing at home for the last four years, taking pictures of every species of moth that I could find. And I'm up to 1,140 species of moths so far in my yard. I'm not finished. I get more every time I, I try it. 30% of them are using oaks. So oaks are the most powerful producer of caterpillars in my yard. And that's why we call oaks keystone species. Remember what a keystone is. This is the Roman arch. The keystone is the, the uh, stone in the middle of the arch. And if you take that stone out, the arch collapses. Well, if you take keystone plants out of your local food web, the food web collapses because they're making most of the food. And oaks are the best keystone plant in 84% of the counties in North America in which they occur. Why do we need all these caterpillars? Well, we need them indirectly. The birds need them directly and many other things that we're not talking about. But let's, people like birds, so we'll focus on them. Here's our, here's our chickadee that, that uh, so many people have heard about. 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to get one clutch of chickadees to the point where they leave the nest. That depends on the number of chicks in the nest. And after they leave the nest, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars for another 21 days. And then the chickadees become independent and keep eating caterpillars. We're talking about uh, tens of thousands of caterpillars to make one clutch of a chickadee, a bird that's a third of an ounce. Um, and you know, not all plants are doing that. Oaks are making, they support 950 species of caterpillars in North America 
four, 550, 557 species in the mid-Atlantic states. There's no other plant genus that supports that that much. Compared to your calorie pear supports none, your crepe myrtle supports none. The non-native plants that we load our landscapes with, they're very poor at making these caterpillars. Okay, June is cicada month. Uh, and because I, I, I promised Doug this would be 40 minutes, we're not gonna talk about cicadas. And you didn't have those periodical cicadas this year anyway, I don't think. So we're gonna skip that, but it was a great, it was great fun. We'll move on to July, uh, and this is when I think, this is what I call the night chorus, and I'm talking about when Katie did start singing. Did a lot of camping in North Jersey when I was a, a boy, and Katie did would sing us to sleep every night, so it's very fun um, sound to me. What happens is these are males, and they lift up their, their uh, first pair of wings. There's a scraper and a file on this part, and they rub it back and forth, and it makes a, a species-specific sound. Why are they doing that? Well, this is why. Once upon a time, there was a young woman named Katie who fell in love with a handsome young man. Alas, he did not share her feelings, and he married another. Soon thereafter, he and his young bride were found poisoned in their bed. Who perpetrated the crime was never determined, but some say the insects in the trees were watching that night, and each summer they solved the mystery by singing, Katie did, Katie did. It's a pretty loud sound. And actually, you really might wonder why they're, they're doing that. Um, there are four species of Katie did, it's a frequent oak, oak forest, and they, they're singing loudly because females uh, will mate with the loudest male. Those males are trying to attract females. This is a female who hasn't expanded her wings yet. She's in the last instar. There's her ovipositor ready to go. But here she is with her wings fully expanded. She's going to choose the loudest male because that's, uh, that's a way to measure male quality. She wants to get the male with the best genes. She can't measure his genetic quality because she can see how loud he is, which is a function of how big he is, uh, and sometimes how, how smart he is. So that's, that's why males are singing as loudly as they can. This is what Katie did eggs look like. They're big flat things glued along stems. These guys have already hatched, but sometimes people find these and wonder what they are. Well, Katie did start singing about mid-July. They'll sing through July, uh, through August. Uh, then they start to peter out in, in the fall. But since we're, we're moving into August, let's talk about the tough leaves that oaks develop over the course of the summer. Their leaves are filled with tannins and lignans that make them extremely difficult to chew if you're an insect. So there's special adaptations to allow caterpillars to keep eating oaks. Uh, and this is the yellow net caterpillar and this il illustrates one of them and that's gregarious feeding. Well, all these little mouths working together can get through that leaf material much easier than if they were um, isolated. This so is what they look like when they're older. They're pretty large caterpillars. They eat a lot of oak material. So gregarious feeding is common in, in oak feeders. This is the uh, orange humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm. Here's our oak tree in 2014. I walked around the base of the tree and counted all the caterpillars that were just within head height. I didn't climb anything to find, find out. And around that single tree, I found 410 caterpillars. 115 of them were yellow neck caterpillars like those big guys eating a lot of, of uh, leaf material. And if people go up and they see uh, you know, an, a, a branch being defoliated, they get all upset. But all those caterpillars are there on this picture. I stood back and took this picture right after I finished counting them. How many of those caterpillars can you see? None. How much of the caterpillar damage can you see? None. But if I told you, oh, you got 410 caterpillars on your oak tree, get the can, spray, call the man, save the tree. Caterpillars are going to kill the tree. None of that's true. Oaks are really good at sharing the energy they've captured from the sun. And if plants didn't do that, we had no other life on the planet. So that's absolutely necessary. Don't spray your oak tree. Um, a woman in, in uh, New Orleans, Tammany Baumgarten, told me years ago that we should all practice the 10-step program. Take 10 steps back from your, your trees and all of your insect problems disappear. That is the best way to treat our our trees, and, and that's the distance that we view our trees from. So another apt adaptation to eating tough oak leaves in August is to become a leaf miner. The toughness is in the cuticle, the upper epidermis, the lower epidermis, the palisade mesophyll, the, the parenchymal cells between those two layers still remain soft and nutritious. So if you get skinny enough, you can mine that in between those, those layers. And this is what a leaf mine looks like. 
a serpentine leaf mine made by a caterpillar, believe it or not. The egg was laid here and it started to eat and chew. It was tiny. The black line is, is frass, it's, it's poops, that it lines it up in the middle, then it got here and it pupated and that was all the leaf material that it, that it needed to reach maturity. This is a blotch leaf mine. Um, there's the caterpillar right there, just goes in a circle making a blotch. Here it is backlit, doesn't look a lot like a caterpillar. And here it is with a good picture from Salvador Vitenza. But this is a specialized uh, series of adaptations to allow it to get really skinny between those leaves. When it emerges as an adult though, it does look like a regular moth. They're tiny, but um, they're pretty common out there. Number of species of Cameraria on oaks, the solitary oak leaf miner, the gregarious oak leaf miner, the oak tentiform leaf miner, all of these things and others are mining in oak leaves. Okay, September, almost done here. We've gone through the year. This is when we notice crickets on the ground. Um, <clears throat> you know, those black crickets, if they, if they get into our house, it's good luck. Uh, but there are crickets up on trees too. They're called bush and tree crickets. They're usually yellowish or, or greenish. Uh, and they're doing the same thing the KD did's doing. They're singing, the males are singing, and they're singing as loud as they can to attract females because females are gonna go to the loudest males. But these guys are really smart about it. They find a hole in the leaf or some species actually chew a hole of the right size in the leaf. Then they stick their head through it, raise their rings, wings up, move them back and forth and make their, their singing chirping sound. Most leaves are kind of a little bit parabolic in shape and it projects that sound farther and louder than if he sang on a flat surface. So he's sending a message to the females that I'm, I'm a big loud male, just what you want. It's a false message, uh, but apparently it, it works. Can you imagine that males are sending females false messages? Hard to believe. Uh, but, you know, it might not be that false because he may not be the largest male, but he might be the smartest male. And she comes and mates with him anyway. Okay, that's it. Now, that's just some, actually a few of the things that are associated with, with oaks as we move through the year. Let's end by talking about how important oaks are at solving a really critical problem crisis now. We've got a biodiversity crisis on this planet. We hear about climate change, really important. Um, but along with climate change, we have a biodiversity crisis. And if we had no climate change at all, we would still have a biodiversity crisis because we are not sharing our spaces with the natural world. We're not sharing our spaces with the nature that keeps us alive. You hear about how birds are disappearing. We've lost 3 billion birds in North America in the last 50 years how uh, our insects are disappearing, we've got global insect decline. There's not, no magic to it. They're not disappearing, they're not vanishing. We are killing them. So we could stop killing them, that would be good. Uh, and because we're not sharing our spaces, um, Earth has now experienced the sixth great extinction event that has ever occurred on, on the planet. So it's a real crisis, it's a global crisis, but it's got a grassroots solution. It's one that you and, and, and me and everybody, me, I, we all could solve together. We all need it to solve, to solve it together because getting rid of nature is not an option. You know, we, we tend to think it's nature's optional, but it's really not. How do I explain to this? There are four things that every landscape has to do uh, in order to be what I would call a sustainable landscape. One of them is, is they've got to sequester carbon. They've got to help pulling the carbon out of the atmosphere um, and locking it up in their tissues and then pumping the extra carbon into the uh, into the ground. You know, we have we have eliminated, what's the figure now? 70% of the forests that used to be on the planet. All that carbon's up in the atmosphere. We now need to, to pull it actively out. We've got fancy machines that can do it really expensive, but trees do it really uh, well and they do it for free. We need to manage the watershed. Every, every property on the planet is within a watershed and nobody has the ethical right to destroy that watershed by the way we landscape it. We need to support, every landscape has to support a diverse community of pollinators, not because they pollinate our crops. You hear they pollinate a third of your crops. It's really about a 12th of, of uh, the crops pollinated by, by animals. It's because they're pollinating 80 to 90% of all plants on the planet and 90% of all flowering plants. We, if we lost our pollinators, we lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet. That is not an option. And we need pollinators everywhere we need plants, which is everywhere, including our yards. And also every landscape has to support a complex food web that's, that, that feeds the animals that run the ecosystems that we all depend on. When you plant an oak, you are accomplishing three of those four 
critically important ecological goals. You're capturing uh, carbon to the best of plant, the plant world's ability. You're managing the watershed with those huge root systems. You're supporting a, the most complex food web that any plant can support. The only thing you're not doing better than other plants is supporting a diverse community of pollinators because oaks are wind pollinated. Three out of four is pretty good though. Well, despite uh, these, these uh, really important landscape attributes, our oaks are in trouble, along with so many other things. The old giants are gone. We took them down right away because they, uh, they took up so much space from our crops and they also had a lot of wood associated with them. The percentage of oaks in our Eastern forest has been cut in half in the last hundred years. And of course, Mike talked about, you know, um, the loss of, of many of those oaks. That's happening because of fire suppression. It's happening because uh, we, we have brought in huge problems like, like gypsy moth and a number of diseases like uh, sudden oak death syndrome and bacterial leaf scorch and, and uh, oak wilt. These are taking a heavy toll on our oaks. We've also fragmented the landscape to the point where many of our oaks are so isolated, the pollen can't get to them. So regeneration is very poor. And because of all those things, uh, we've got 28 of the 91 North American oak species that are now threatened. One third of the global oaks are endangered. Oregon white oak used to occur from mid California all the way up through Washington state has lost 97% of its, of its range. There are 2,300 species that rely on oaks in Great Britain that are threatened because of the loss of oaks in Great Britain. You know, we humans live out our lives in a very brief instant of ecological time, and we cannot return those giant oak trees to our forest during that, that time period, but we can start the process. And in no time at all, those oaks will grow up to the point where they're contributing huge amounts of ecological services to our landscape, rapidly becoming keystone species in our yards. Everybody in the planet is responsible for good earth stewardship because everybody in the planet requires healthy ecosystems. Whether you like nature or not, you require it. So the best way to exercise the responsibility to, to uh, planet Earth is to embrace the power of, of oaks. So for the sake of our turkeys, our chickadees, our woodpeckers, our warblers, our jays, our thrushes, our emeralds, our prominence, our gallers, our weevils, our orthopterans, plant an oak, plant a living community, plant the future. Thanks very much. Well, thank you, Doug. Um, we've had so many great questions rolling in and ultimately I wish we had um, just, you know, two hours for both Doug and Mike to have presented fully. We packed a lot in there. Um, and I wanted to add to another thing we can do wherever you are, we have people tuning in everywhere, get to know your local conservation district. It's a great place to start. Um, and so I'd like to invite Mike back and uh, Drew's gonna help facilitate some of the Q and A. So if you had any other questions, please chat them in. Um, Take it away, Drew. Thank you. Thank you both, Mike and Doug. Um, Doug said something that was, uh, it resonated with me and it reminded me of a quote. So I wanna share that with you all. I put it in the chat here. Uh, it says, in the end, we will conserve only what we love. We will only love what we understand and we will understand only what we are taught. And I believe both of you captured the essence of that because you're teaching us things and it's intriguing and, um, and we have so many questions, so let's jump into it. But thank you. So um, Mike, I wanna start with you. I'm kinda just gonna do a back and forth thing if you guys are okay with that. Um, Mike, first question, uh, do you have a thought about how quickly or gradually you'd remove uh, overstory maples to discourage the emergence of invasives. Do it all at once or gradually over a five-year period? I would suggest gradually. So uh, tinker around the edges, work slowly, start with the understory, start with the, um, you know, the, the shrub layer and the smaller species before um, changing the overstory. Once you bring in a lot of light, it's, it's hard to control what happens so so go slow how amazing is that that just you offer a little bit of light and it, it explodes <laughs> right a lot of us have seen that fun to see fun to recognize once you start looking for it all right thank you mike doug um first question for you do oak mass 
years mean anything other than you explain. Thank you so much for sharing your joy of birds. Do they mean anything else? Yeah, could you elaborate? What the, what the question is, but if you mean, can we predict them and are they, are they fairly regular? The answer is no. Um, it seems to be an interaction between all the things I talked about and, and what I didn't talk about, and that is weather. So let's say all the, all the stars align, it's gonna be an oak year or a mast year. Uh, and it turns out to be a really cold spring with a lot of rain when the, the pollen is dropping. That'll discourage that, that uh, mast year. So there'll be a lot of energy and, and it'll happen the following year. We had an oak mast in 2019 that went from Massachusetts to Georgia to the Mississippi. So that spanned all kinds of weather systems. So it's more than just weather. Uh, but it, I have not heard, maybe you know, Mike, uh, whether yeah. people really can predict oak mass. I can't. Uh, people ask me all the time, and I don't know. <laughs> no, no but he's like, nope, not touching that one. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for answering that. And uh, I think that's something that you, you briefly covered, but something that everyone can look into as well, do their own research. So, um, Mike, for you, uh, your next question, when you remove the understory competitors, do you use stump cut herbicides or basal bark, or, or do you not worry about root interaction and killing your desired trees? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I don't know um, that, again, I would say go slowly. There, there have been uh, plenty of instances where people have used herbicides and uh, that has gone through the roots and killed killed oaks, you know, in some cases. So, um, so keep so herbicide is is what we use a lot of times. And to be clear, it's it's very small amount of herbicide just on the cambium layer, right on the edge of that growth ring, just that outer growth ring. You're not spraying it. You can use a sponge and dab it right on, so so you reduce uh, any incidental damage. But um, you know, going slowly, trying, you can try it without herbicide, uh, but it'll probably re-sprout and re-sprout and re-sprout. Uh, it's possible that you could exhaust, it could exhaust its root reserves and die uh, and during a drought. And so doing it later in the summer when the soil is dry, it, it has been shown to be more effective. So uh, avoiding spring cutting and cutting. So without herbicide, doing it later in the growing season during the height of the the dry period in the summer that, that can um, uh, help. And the other thing that a lot of land managers have done with great success in open fields is mow twice during the summer. Mow um, in, in midsummer and in late summer and that without herbicide has been shown uh, time and time again, that's like a recipe for success without using herbicide. That, that's perfect. Actually, kind of bouncing off of that, could we touch a little bit on oak wilt and how you should be treating that? Oh, that that's that's a rough one. Um, Putting you on the spot. Sorry. <laughs> I, I know. So, so I I don't claim to be an authority on oak wilt, and I might be a little um, uh, out there on this one, but. I, I don't see it as that big of a problem with natural systems. I think oak, oak okay. lets through root systems. And if we can open up, like in my background here, if we can open up that canopy, allow um, space between the root systems, it's not an issue. It's more of an issue with the black oak. It's not as big of an issue with the white oak. And I don't want to see us destroying forests, which is what happens. A lot of our management destroys the forest for the oak wilt. Um, I'm less, I, you know, I'm less concerned about it as an ecologist. I look at it as, as a process that's happening, but I don't claim to be an expert and maybe other people have uh, more knowledge about it. Well, if okay. I could add to that. Yeah. that oh, sorry. Um, we, need, we need to select for resistance to not just oak wilt, but bacterial wilt, you know, sudden oak, all these things. There are a small number of the trees depending on the disease that, that have natural resistance. And those are the ones that have to be promoted. Uh, and so it could be 
even ash with the emerald ash borer, there's some resistance out there. So we need to keep planting these trees instead of not planting them to discover that resistance and let it spread. Remember those blue jays, they're spreading the acorns that successfully were produced that year. That's gonna come from a resistant tree. So over the years, it will replace the susceptible trees. The same way that's happened for uh, dogwoods, the Florida dogwood, we had the anthracnose and everybody said, we're gonna lose them all. We didn't, the resistant ones are now fine and the anthracnose is very much depressed. So keep planting your oaks. Perfect, thank you guys so much. And that answers a few questions I had for you both. So um, moving on, I have my next question for Doug, uh, could keeping leaves through the winter provide better fuel for fires that reduce competition? You talked a little bit about leaf litter and soil health, but is, how does that relate to fire and reducing competition? Well, fire is, is a, a normal part of the sequence in a fire climax community, but there, fire, real fires in a real community are fairly infrequent. They don't happen every single year. And when you have a fire, it's often patchy. It's not burning every single spot, unless it's too hot and it goes crazy and we don't want that. Um, so a, in a typical, you know, if you're managing, the, the recommendation is you burn a third, a third, and a third, so that any one place is only burned once every th three years, and there's two thirds of your burn area left to recolonize what you did burn. The fire is going to kill what's in the in the leaf litter, um, but it has to happen once in a while. You just don't want it to happen everywhere uh, in a way that's that's so hot that it actually kills the soil community too. Thank you so much. Um, Mike, I know uh, there was a moment in the video where we not everyone could hear you, so I definitely uh, had a couple of questions about shelterwood. Do you mind explaining shelterwood again? Sure. A shelterwood is a forest management practice that is um, a type of clear cut, but it happens over a period of years. So uh, usually uh, something like a third of the canopy is removed. That, and so there's trees that are left, adult trees that can feed into those open areas. And um, it allows a response of the understory, uh, a, a response of the understory and seedling layer. And then uh, the five, 10 years later, a period of time later, another uh, portion of the canopy will be removed. Sometimes the rest of the canopy is removed or a portion of it is removed. And then again, five, 10 years later, the next portion is removed. That's a really for common forest management practice for regenerating forests. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Doug, next, next question for you. Um, when planting oaks in your yard, do they benefit from having other oaks planted nearby? You spoke a little bit about this as well. Well, yeah, particularly for pollination. Um, you need other oaks. So the male and female flowers are produced on a single tree, but not at the same time. It's asynchronously produced. So when the pollen is released, the female flowers on that tree are not open yet. So you need another tree to have released pollen so that you get your, your uh, female flowers pollinated. And the pollen floats, floats around. But for example, I have one shingle oak in my yard and there's no other shingle oaks around. And every year it tries to make acorns, thousands of them. And every year they're aborted because they were never pollinated. So I would need another shingle oak to get successful pollination. Um, you also, you know, remember all those things you're, you're supporting with the oak. Um, two trees is always gonna be better than one and three is gonna be better than two. So the bigger, the better in ecology for the most part. Now I don't wanna, I've been criticized for, for talking as if oaks are the only good plants. They're not, we want diversity. Um, there are more than, than one type of keystone plant. I just don't want you to leave out the best ones. Right, right, <laughs> thank you. Mike, I have, this one's a good question. Um, it says, I wonder at what life stage do you think red maples are most problematic for oak growth? Is there an effect that prevents acorn germination? And how long are those acorns viable uh, undergrowth in those sandy soils? That's a lot of questions, but it covers a lot of uh, other people's questions too, if you don't mind. Right, so, um, so oak acorns 
are not pliable more than uh, their, their first season. So the white oak will germinate in the fall and uh, right off the bat, and the, the black oak acorns, the red oak acorns will germinate in the spring. And, and a lot of the acorns, as Doug pointed out, are eaten by weevils and other species. So, uh, and red maple, um, some people hypothesize that there may be effects at the mycorrhizae level uh, with oaks, that it's inhibiting oaks in that capacity. I don't think that research is fully fleshed out yet, or maybe I'm not up on this current research. And um, the other part of that question with red maple is how red maple are competing or at what stage red maple are affecting oaks. Yeah, at what stage is it more problematic for the oaks? Yeah, well, once it gets into the canopy, it, uh, I, I, if I would have had more time, I would have show, showed more slides, the red maple versus an oak canopy, it's a night and day difference. Oak lets so much light in, and red maple is, is, has, is just does a great job of lacking light to the oak story. So once it's into the, I, I mean, to the understory. So once it's a canopy tree, it, it's really difficult. Um, and then it, it's, and it, it's uh, so abundant as the photo I showed, uh, I did show with red maple in it. You can see how much light it's intercepting with the oaks. So I, I don't think there's, it's, a, it's a, um, so much competition at the ground layer with red maple. That, that is the case with sugar, it can be the case with sugar maple forming these uh, large areas of um, uh, ground cover, but it's at, at that, as it's reaching higher in the canopy or as it's in, into the understory, it's just blocking so much light that is preventing oaks from, from being able to hang on uh, too very long. They, they, um, they're not able to get from that seedling to that sapling layer to get high enough to get there. Okay. Um, I also want to remind people that his slides are available to look back on. And Mike, if you want to share any more photos, I'd be happy to pass those on to people so they can see. But along with that, I want to ask this, do older oaks decline in acorn production? It's just another question that might go along with this. Doug, do you want to, you might know, you might have done research on that. No, I have not done any research on that. <laughs> I think, I think they're pretty good for a very long time, but there is that 300 year period of decline where everything's declining. Uh, it, just remember, even a dead oak is, is valuable in a number of ways. It's not making any acorns, but it's got a lot of cavities in it. They can stand for, for decades, uh, but a very, very old oak probably is going to have acorn decline. But yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure. I don't know that it, I don't know why it would necessarily. Um, and the amount of acorns that produce are just massive. So I think there'll be plenty for um, it's a matter of the predators and in in forests, uh, they, they just need a lot of the oak species require a lot of light. Yeah. Maybe me, age me... isn't a factor. Maybe maybe there's another issue that they need to look into if it's not producing as much. Remember, you got those oak mass, so you can go several years with no acorns, and you might think, oh, it stopped, and then all of a sudden it'll do it. A lot of people worry about the hollow places in oaks, in any tree. Remember, the center of a tree is dead xylem, which is dead wood, and in, in a very old oak, uh, fungus comes and, and eats it out. That's not where the strength of the tree is. The strength of the tree is in the living portion of the tree and the outer, outer rim, uh, and you might worry, oh, my tree's really weakened, but think of a pipe. A pipe is totally hollow. It is really, really strong. And that's what an, an oak trunk is. So when you, when you have a, an arborist say you've got a hollow spot, you got to take it down. Unless it's right next to your house, I would fight that. Uh, you, it's going to live an awful long time after that. Wonderful. Thank you. Physics dictates that the hollow tree is actually the stronger tree. And um, one thing that Doug didn't mention, but I've heard before, and, and maybe Doug knows about this, is those hollow trees are where moth, a lot of moths go during the, during the daytime. Uh, you can I've heard people talking about shining a light up and seeing just hundreds of moths in a hollow tree. And good point, good point. Critically, ecologically, those, those uh, trees with holes in them, those hollow trees. Wonderful, thank you guys. Uh, Doug, question for you. 
Geographically, how wide of an area does a massing event tend to cover? What a massing year up, what would a massing year up in central Michigan align with massing in southern Ohio, Kentucky, too? We have some people on from different states. Right. Um, based on the huge mass that we had in 2019 in the east, I would say it could align, but they're also much more local mass. So it's not always huge. And this is part of that unpredictable unpredictability of mass. We're just not sure what's coordinating things. I have a feeling that that massive one in 2019 was unusual. It's usually much more localized. So a Michigan uh, mass, well, I'm guessing probably not will, will not align with a Kentucky uh, mass, but I'm guessing. So it very well could. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. Um, oh, I have a good one. I need to find it now. I think it was here in the chat. Sorry about that. Basically, I would like to uh, have one more turn with both of you. If you had one piece of advice or one thing to close with, what would you what would you tell people, Mike? Well. I, I love Doug's message of planting oaks. I, I just, you know, frankly, I just think they're absolutely gorgeous, beautiful trees. And um, in Eastern North America, historically, white oak was the most common tree in this area. Today, it's one of the species that has been taken out of forests uh, because it was so widely used for barrel making, for barn siding, for, for uh, old, the dashboards of Oldsmobiles. And you know so many things. So uh, so we find a lot of black oak as the most abundant tree in a lot of our forests, where historically it was white oak. Not that we don't have white oak; we have plant, we have a lot of white oak. But that's a tree that um, I would rec I always recommend to anybody to plant. So uh, and lastly, I would say help out with stewardship. Get involved in your local stewardship network chapter or. Uh, efforts to the local county parks or wherever you live, get involved in stewardship and help, you know, control in Washtenaw County, uh, get uh, help control invasive shrubs, remove uh, red maple from oak forests. I, I, red maple is a beautiful tree. I don't have anything against red maple, but in our oak forest, it, it's a newcomer. All of our age class distribution model uh, charts from each, each site show red maple came in 60, 70 years ago, whereas the oaks, you know, they, most of our sites went up to 150, a lot of them up to 150 years. But, oh, so the red maple is a newcomer. It wasn't in the survey notes and in, and in our sites either. So it's a newcomer. And uh, if we can keep it out of these old forests, that would be super helpful. Thank you, Mike. And you had wonderful slides and your maps were great. And I just want to remind people that those slides are available and we have a lot to learn. Um, and do you want to tell us a little bit about your book before I close or I talk to Doug? So, oh, uh, yeah, so, so Michigan Natural Features Inventory is where I was for many years before coming. And so, so um, the work I presented today is through their, their website, their uh, website on the natural communities of Michigan. Um, that's where I worked with my former colleagues to describe the ecosystems of Michigan. And, and, and it's some of that information then is synthesized into several of these books and they're available through Amazon. Uh, um, most of awesome, thank you. So I would encourage you to go to the website of Michigan Natural Features Inventory, look up natural communities and you'll find uh, uh, just a wealth of information on the ecosystems of Michigan. Yeah. Wonderful, Doug, would you uh, like to close us out and tell, tell us some final thoughts? What would you like to leave people with? I would like to leave people with the request to go to our website, homegrownnationalpark.org and consider joining Homegrown National Park, um, which is easy because it's free. All you have to do if you're, if you're conducting any type of conservation on your property, and if you're not, please consider doing that. Planting a single oak tree is a good way to start. Register your property so that your little piece of your county will light up the amount of area that you're, you're conserving. The object is to record visually all of the efforts by private citizens for conservation in our typical human dominated landscapes. 
we want the message that everybody is an important part of the future of conservation, everybody, to go viral. We want to reach all the people who never think about this. They think they're totally separated from nature. So if you go to our website, we're trying to get that message across and, and join, you know, get yourself on the map and we can watch the whole U.S. light up as we, as we tackle this huge problem together. Beautifully said. That inspires us conservationists too. And take it away, Doug. Thank you both so much. Yeah, again, thank you to, to both Doug and Mike. It's been such an honor to have two of our favorite authors here tonight. And I wish we had more time. Uh, we got a lot of questions through. I want to put the final uh, plug in for our upcoming events with the Conservation District. Uh, we have a native plant expo and marketplace coming up on June 4th. They'll be at the Chelsea Community Fairgrounds. Our plant sales for the spring, our pre-sales are going on right now at our online store. Our next talk in this series is with Vern Stevens of Designs by Nature, um, following up from his talk last year. And we also had mentioned the forestry program, uh, the tree survey. So um, again, thank you for all attendees. We had a great turnout, uh, looked like around 250 people. And Doug and Mike, uh, so much gratitude for the work you're doing and spreading the word. Um, so thank you for being here tonight. You're welcome. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Uh, follow up with us at the Washington Conservation District if you have more questions. And thanks for being here.